Hi guys, welcome to FD92. We're going to do a little uh, presentation today about knowing your customer. One of the most important things that we can try to do as a designer to help us uh, design correctly and, and of course uh, as we remember, so we are designing always for our customer. Uh, sometimes our ego can get in the way of with this. We can tend to want to design for ourselves. Um, and of course, no matter what, uh, our style is going to influence what we design, uh, just like we have our own handwriting. Uh, everything we do sort of has our own style sort of ingrained in it. However, it's our job to hone this style and design in a way that meets the needs of our customers. Because at the end of the day, we are trying to sell our clothing. Uh, we're not designing just for us, we're designing for customers, we're designing for a market, um, for a business. So it's very important to sort of take information in about your customer, process it, and output it into uh, your design, depending on what your specific customer needs, wants, um, and will be attracted to. So people use clothing to define who they are. Now this is uh, true all across the world and in all cultures. Um, we utilize clothing to tell stories about ourselves to other people. Um, it's our way of sort of controlling the narrative that gets put out about ourselves. And um, of course in different situations, uh, different places, uh, different groups, and even in sort of different occasions for us specifically, um, we will use different clothing, uh, purchase different clothing, again, to tell different stories about ourselves. Uh, and again, because clothing is sort of the first thing someone will see about us, um, we might not even sort of talk to them or interact with them, but they'll see what we're wearing. Uh, and it is used all across the world, again, as this really important tool to um, first and foremost sort of communicate uh, who we are, what we value, what we do, uh, what we sort of want portrayed about us. And again, this will change depending on who we are, where we are, how old we are, um, and even um, uh, uh, amongst one specific person, what we're specifically doing or what occasion we're going to at the time. Um, so a person, uh, uh, to sort of elaborate on that, a person will have different styles of clothing in their wardrobe for different occasions and at different price points. So when a designer is thinking about their customer, they must not only think about their specific customer, what their likes, uh, dislikes are, what they value, but also for what occasion in the customer's life they are designing for. So one single customer may dress very differently for different things in their life. So just take a look at your own closet. I'm sure you'll see lots of different outfits um, that you tend to wear to different things. So um, you may wear something very differently if you're just gonna stay home, sit on the couch, if you're just going out with you know some friends at a very casual location, if you're going out on a date, you may wear something differently. If you're going to a job interview, you may wear something differently. If you're going to uh, a church or religious ceremony, you may dress very differently. If you're going to see you know a family reunion, you may dress differently. So again, depending on all these different occasions, we're going to have sort of uh, different clothing that comes from different markets, maybe different designers that help us to sort of compartmentalize and differentiate the sort of different aspects of our own personality and lives. Um, <clears throat> the goal of the designer is not to design for all occasions, but to focus on one factor uh, of that customer's life and design for that. Now it's important to understand why we do this. So when people uh, uh, sort of think about designs, they're like, well, I'll just sort of design for all occasions. But the customer doesn't want a one-size-fits-all brand. They are looking to differentiate and separate these different aspects of their life. They want sort of, you know, their cool, uh, sexy going out looks to be different than their more conservative, professional outfits. Um, so when they're looking for these sort of differences, uh, they're going to look to different brands. And because things are coming from different brands, that helps establish the fact that these are for separate occasions, therefore different, 
even versions of me. Um, if again we are going to one brand that sort of uh, what we say dilutes the brand. So one brand that you know um, sells sweatpants that you lie around with but also uh, sells prom dresses um, you're going to be kind of skeptical about both of them and say, well, look at this, they're stretching themselves too thin, so to speak. I don't want to get a fancy prom dress or gown from the same place that I get sweatpants because that's different parts of me. That's, I need a separation from them. So it's much more successful um, uh, and attractive to our customers if we sort of align our brand with, with one occasion or one sentimentality or one market. Um, and it allows, again, the customer uh, to differentiate these different parts of their life as well. So who is your customer? Even though, again, your customer may have clothing made for different markets, so formal, comfortable, casual, whatever it is, their personality and overall characteristics will influence everything that they wear. So again, um, even though they have these different separate occasions or separate markets that they're looking for, their overall traits will influence everything that they wear. And this is sort of a general idea of what we sort of look for um, in our customer persona. So their likes, their dislikes, their values, the challenges they face, they face the goals that they want to attain, their jobs, their education level, their uh, industry that they work in, their income, the location, gender, age, all of these different things uh, will impact uh, uh, an overall sort of style or trend that, again, will influence every part of uh, their wardrobe, even if it's from prom dresses to down to, uh, or gowns down to, you know, your sweatpants or your casual looks. So what are some of these uh, uh, values that customers have? So um, politics, causes, and values can be something that uh, customers feel very strongly about and will influence uh, overall all markets of what they buy. And this, again, it might be a political affiliation, it might be a specific cause, uh, it might be something that they value. Um, so here, uh, uh, you know, uh, eco-friendly might be a value that they hold. So this will influence their purchasing uh, and, and style preferences across the board uh, throughout uh, their wardrobe. I kind of want to check something because I thought I had, okay, I guess not. Put that first. Sorry guys. <clears throat> Age is also another factor. So age is one of the largest customer aspects that a designer must consider. Although it might seem like a designer should design for all ages to increase their customer base, uh, this again can backfire on them. Older people tend to have different priorities for dress. Also trying to design for too large an age range can turn off your target customer. We think about it most young people don't want to dress like they're older and most old people don't want to dress like they're younger so if they see older people wearing the same clothes that this they are it might turn them off and vice versa if older people see young uh, uh, customers wearing what they're wearing it might turn them off to that brand or that clothing oh that's a young brand that's an older brand again um, it's always more effective to target your market um, Age can also influence many other factors like price point, style, and construction. For instance, um, your older customer tends to be further along in their career, further along in their life, uh, and therefore typically has access to more money than a younger customer. So your younger age groups tend to be at lower price points than your older age groups. Um, style, of course. Uh, um, Older customers tend to not like to be so flashy uh, uh, and uh, sexy. Uh, they don't tend to reveal as much skin as younger groups. Um, again, this is a, a number of different factors. Of course, there's the obvious that uh, older uh, age segments tend to, um, uh, again, sort of start to get a little bit wrinkly, a little bit saggly, so they don't want to be showing off quite as much skin. Um, but it's also sort of more psychological like that. When you get older, you just simply become more comfortable who you are. 
Um, so a lot of people say, oh, you know, uh, especially younger designers, oh, the older people can be comfortable in their skin. Well, um, this is true, but they fail to see what actually represents being comfortable who you are. Uh, when you're comfortable who you are, there's no need to dress provocatively. Provocatively, uh, dressing provocatively is, is really asking for attention. It's asking for approval. It's asking, oh, please think I'm sexy. Um, but if you're older and more comfortable with who you are, you don't really have this need anymore. You don't need people to look at you. You don't need or crave attention or acceptance. Um, again, because you're satisfied with who you are. So it's more complex um, psychologically than just, oh, older people don't like to show as much skin because, um, you know, they're not quite as young anymore. Um, it's, it's much more than that. Also, the look for different things in construction. Um, older people tend to value quality uh, and consistency more than younger people. Younger people tend to buy clothes. Um, that are ch more cheaply made, again, because it's in their price point, but they're a little bit more fickle. They are tend to go more with styles and less with what they like uh, personally. Older people will go more for quality. They'll buy something that will last longer that they like, uh, regardless of uh, uh, sort of changing trends and things like that. Music. So musicians have very long been uh, uh, huge fashion influencers, and today many even have their own clothing lines as well. So the type of music that a person likes to listen to can greatly affect how they choose to dress. Hobbies. Hobbies can also influence a customer's wardrobe. Sometimes the special clothing is uh, needed or preferred for a specific hobby, and sometimes the co uh, customer just wants to signal their interest in a specific hobby through their clothing. Profession. A customer's profession may require them to wear a certain type or style of clothing for their work. This will influence a whole section of a customer's word wardrobe as it is necessary for them to quote unquote look the part at their job site. And again, there's the old phrase, dress for the job that you want, not the one that you have. And a lot of people take this very seriously. So they will dress um, again to communicate uh, what they want, what their goals are in their professions, what their outlook is. Um, and depending on the profession, this may uh, vary quite drastically to uh, what they need, uh, their clothing to do for them. Geographic location and religion. So people wear clothing not only to express individual tastes and sentimentalities, but also largely to fit in with the culture around them. Um, or even if they're in uh, a new location to signal uh, um, where they are from, basically their cultural roots and things like that. This could include styles that are defined by traditional dress and religion specific to a certain culture. And here we have different examples of uh, women around the world uh, dressing very differently um, according to their traditional values influenced again by uh, their culture and uh, religion. We have uh, just to go down it, you know, uh, uh, sorry, traditional to India, um, uh, these beautiful uh, African geometric uh, prints, uh, very uh, specific to Ghana, uh, some Iranian women, again, with uh, the headscarves, which have a religious background, um, a Texas woman um, who has that sort of cowboy, kind of Old West sentimentality uh, that is carried on into the modern age. And we have a young Peruvian girl uh, where traditional textiles still play a big role in um, the fashion uh, expressed in uh, uh, their culture. What your customer needs. So how to design clothing that meets the needs and expectations of your customers. So this is, is very uh, common sort of marketing lingo whenever we're creating or selling a product we have to think about how that product meets the needs and expectations of your customer. So we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, about specific needs uh, for our customers. And we've talked a little bit about this before, but I'm sort of gonna expand upon them. So technical performance needs. 
So technical performance needs of a garment refer to how well the garment physically does its intended job. Um, so all clothing has kind of a base level of technical performance that it needs to achieve. So at the very base level, garments need to be able to be put on and off. So you need to be able to, you know, um, design the closures for easy access uh, to be taken on and off. Uh, it must allow the wearer to move. We are assuming that the uh, wearer does want to at least walk around a little bit. Um, uh, you know, base levels of movement. Um, they don't have to be super active, but they need to be able to walk a little bit, maybe use their arms, things like that. Um, they need to be able to, uh, and the clothing needs to stand up to at least a little bit of repeated cleaning. Now, of course, they may require dry cleaning or special cleaning, but it still needs to go through this process at least a few times. Um, and price point can play a big part in even the base technical performance of the garment. So cheaper clothing uh, will not last as long as well-made, more expensive clothing. Even cheap clothing still needs to be able to be put on and off and um, allow you to move. But again, cheaper clothing will not last um, quite uh, as many washing rounds um, or just m as many wears as more expensive, well-made clothing that uses better stitching techniques, uh, better finishing techniques, and stronger fabrics. Sorry for that embarrassing picture. <laughs> Uh, technical performance needs kind of at a moderate level. Um, so some garments will need to perform on a moderately technical level, for instance, winter clothing. Uh, so winter clothing must be warm and protect the wearer against the elements. Um, again, who wants a winter coat that doesn't keep them warm? Um, and again, this can be based on uh, where your geographic location of your customer is, uh, the colder the climate is, the more these clothe these outerwear um, and you know winter clothing uh, garments that you create are going to need to perform. So if you say think about you know oh maybe um, a person in Virginia they have fairly mild winters it gets a little chilly so again the garments aren't going to need to perform that highly because it doesn't get that cold in the winter. But if you take someone in Sweden um, the winters are very cold and very long. Um, their winter clothing is going to need to perform at a much higher level um, than, again, someone from G Virginia or has a, a place where there are warmer winters. Um, a similar market uh, that has moderate technical needs, maybe like swimwear or, or sort of beachside wear, these again must be able to hold up to um, a prolonged exposure to sun, um, prolonged and repeated exposure to water, even salt water, um, and again, movement. Uh, so again, price point will factor into a garment's ability to perform under these circumstances. So again, more expensive, um, you know, winter wear uh, will tend to be warmer and perform better. Um, we'll have better fabrics, better construction, better insulating materials. Again, those might be more expensive and raise the price point. Um, same with our swimwear. So um, if we are offering swimwear that we're saying, hey, this is going to last season after season, um, you can spend all day in the sun with it. The colors won't bleach out. The salt water is not going to harm it. You can move and do anything with it. Um, uh, and it will be absolutely fantastic. That's what you want to go for. But that is going to cost a little bit more money, again, because the construction is going to be a little bit better, the dyeing processes need to be a little bit better, the fabrics need to be a little bit better. So all that is going to make it a little bit more expensive. But again, it's going to perform better. And if your customer needs it to perform, say they love going to the beach every day in the summer, um, uh, that is what they're going to spend their money on. Then of course there's high performance uh, garments, of course. And um, this you know, uh, variety of clothing uh, needs to perform much more than just a basic or moderate uh, level of technicality. And again, they're usually called high performance clothing no matter what category they're in. Um, usually this type of clothing is, is specifically designed for a unique activity and its construction and design is defined by accommodating what the wearer will be experiencing during this activity. So if they need great range of motion, if they need um, uh, cooling, um, if they need, so for running, this is going to be specially designed to 
um, uh, allow for the foot to come in contact with the ground, a, an optimal way to um, optimize performance um, and even optimize enjoyment. So this, this is a high performance swimwear. It makes um, the wear very, very hydrodynamic. Um, it probably um, acts to uh, allow for a great range of motion, uh, things like that. And here we see a sort of hiker. Again, this, this outfit needs to keep them comfortable, warm, dry, uh, uh, hold up to all sorts of different elements um, and things like that. So um, again, when we're looking at these types of clothing, they tend to be a little bit more expensive because the performance needs are very great very unique, very specific. Uh, they often require special materials, special construction uh, techniques, um, uh, uh, and also testing. So um, not only do we need to utilize all these things to create a high performing garment that will optimize the performance or enjoyment of a specific hobby, we need to test to see that it works. So there's not only design, but an additional element of sort of research and testing that will go into the development of these garments. So all of those different things um, tend to put these highly technical garments at a much higher price point than um, other garments. But of course, if your customer truly needs um, a, a fully optimized experiment experience, they're willing to pay these higher prices. Psychological needs. So once we're done and through with our technical needs, we need to take a look at psychological needs. And the psychological needs of clothing tend to be a little bit um, uh, larger and greater uh, for clothing outside, you know, the high, highly technical performance. And psychological needs can vary greatly. Um, and they can also impart price point. So what, what I mean by that is the greater the psychological need or the greater uh, 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 the need for a customer to sort of communicate um, a, a theme or an idea or something about themselves, um, the more they're willing to pay for that. So for instance, let's take maybe just like, you know, everybody. So as I was saying before, everybody has a sort of sliding scale of price point within their own closet based on what they need for their clothing. Um, at the very low end, if you're hanging out and you just want to be comfy and cozy while you're, you know, on your computer or watching TV or whatever else, um, there's not a bunch of psychological performance that needs to be done here. Uh, it's more technical performance, you just need to be comfortable. And again, that is not very hard to achieve. Um, there's not a lot of movement going on here. So again, um, this is very low technical performance um, and almost no psychological performance. Again, um, low psychological because when you're doing this activity, you're usually alone or you're with people that are you're very comfortable with, um, family uh, or, or very close friends that you don't, they already know you, you don't really need to communicate with them uh, very much. And again, uh, there's almost no psychological need uh, being performed by this garment right here. So again, our sort of casual lounge clothes tend to be of a lower price point. Again, we don't need them to perform um, technically or psychologically that much. So we're not willing to pay extra for them. Uh, we just want to be comfortable. Who cares what we look like, right? On the total opposite polar end of that, we have something like a wedding dress. So this is high point, high need to perform psychologically. So a lot of women, uh, when they think about their wedding dress, of course, it's it's not only a huge uh, day for them, it's, you know, their day. Um, it's sort of a, a fantasy that they're playing out. Um, I'm the princess today, I'm the special one, I'm the bride. Um, and it there's, throughout many cultures too, a long uh, cultural tradition of dressing up and and um, uh, endowing the bride with you know uh, beautiful textiles and, and, and garments and, and jewelry and uh, embellishment um, again uh, for this day. The idea is they're sort of fulfilling a, a fantasy of, of being an ideal woman, uh, an ideal love interest. Um, and it's that's why we see again a lot of wedding clothing, very romantic. 
uh, very rooted in sort of a fantasy-like aesthetic. Um, and again, that's the psychological need that they're performing. The bride themselves wants to live out their quote-unquote fantasy wedding. Um, and that involves them being, you know, like a princess or beautiful woman or whatever else. Um, uh, they're the special singular one. Um, and again, this is also a, a, a very interesting way that we signify it within um, a cultural tradition as well. So um, within most cultures, the bridal garments are meant to stand out from everything else. So there's certain rules. So in Western weddings, it's white. In other um, uh, uh, cultures, it's red. Or there's typically specific colors and textiles that are used for the bride to specifically allow her to stand out and above from the rest of the people at the wedding. Um, and again, that is what we want to do. We need to stand out and above. Um, and again, since uh, this is, you know, wedding day is, is, is a lot of times in a lot of women's minds, sort of their most special day, um, they're willing to pay so much more um, for this one garment than they are for a lot of other things in their lives. Uh, and this uh, uh, has a high need to perform psychologically. There's a lot of different tasks it needs to perform psychologically. Um, to satisfy the customer. The customer needs to know that they're special, they're the fantasy princess, this is um, uh, their special day, they're unique, uh, they're desirable, they're attractive. Um, uh, they need to build this fantasy up and around about themselves. Um, and again, in this situation, they're pretty much gonna be seen by their friends, their family, acquaintances. Uh, typically, weddings tend to be very huge. So again, here where you're chilling out alone, no one's even gonna see you, uh, as opposed to here, not only do I need all these different things to convince myself, uh, I need to also convince all of these different people. And again, people special to me, people close to me, um, uh, and even all the way down to people I might not even know, but a lot of different um, uh, people around me need to know that this is my special day, I'm a pretty princess, um, and again, that's why wedding dresses are so expensive, even more expensive than uh, what you might just typically consider uh, this dress to be. Obviously, there's very nice materials, there's very nice construction, different things like that. But even considering that, um, uh, there's even a bump up in the price markup, market, uh, markup um, even more than just considering the nice fabric and the nice construction. Because again, um, we need to sort of pay uh, for what we believe in uh, or what we want to believe in. And uh, in a lot of ways, this taps into um, uh, the psychology of all consumers and all people. Um, when we pay more for something, um, we have a greater assurance that it's going to perform what we need it to. So most people will use price as a signifier as quality. This might not be true, um, but in most cases, um, if we're not really, really, really well acquainted with uh, the construction process um, or the you know technical specs of something, we will just rely on price to tell us whether it's quality or not. Um, and again, when you have such a high psychological need uh, for something to do uh, what you, again, what you needed to do, you're willing to pay more to achieve that, or at least to reassure you that it will achieve it. Whether it will or not, again, that depends on every individual circumstance. It may not. You may pay a lot and you may not um, convince everyone that you're the pretty, pretty princess or whatever else. But again, um, we are more comfortable and confident uh, when we spend more money to achieve these goals. Um, and that is, it, it's just a sort of psychological thing that is true amongst people. Uh, for instance, another sort of example of that, uh, um, regular people, there was a very famous study where regular people were asked to, you know, test wines. Um, and all the wines, you know, is a varied array of, of different wines. And uh, the only thing that the people were told was the price of the wine. Now, they were not told the correct 
price of the rot wine. The prices were completely random. Um, so sometimes they were told that the wine was cheaper than it actually was. Sometimes they were told it was much more expensive than it actually was. Um, however, in all instances, or almost all instances, people said that they preferred the, what they were told was the more expensive wine, regardless if it actually, if it was the actual, uh, uh, actual expensive wine or not. Sometimes it was the cheap wine. They were just told it was expensive. In that case, they still said the more uh, expensive wine was preference. And this was a real life example of how people relate price to quality, uh, again, when their own personal knowledge tends to fail them about the specifics of a market. And again, most people are not seamstresses. Most people are not designers. Most people are not pattern makers. So they really don't know anything about what makes a garment expensive or not expensive. So they'll just look at the price and if it's a high price, they'll assume that it was well made. They'll assume that it was made with nice fabrics. And they'll assume that it'll achieve the psychological needs that it, uh, they need them to. So let's take a look at some of our psychological needs um, that clothing can provide for us. Uh, the first one being style, of course. Uh, a customer may have the psychological need to look stylish and they want to communicate that to others. Uh, they want to say, hey, I'm fashionable, I'm chic, I'm current. In this situation, they are willing to pay more for a brand that is able to align themselves with these ideals or, or what they think is more fashionable. The more important it is for the customer to meet this need, the more they're willing to pay for it. And again, we'll see this time and time again. The greater the need is for the customer to achieve this communication, um, the more they're willing to pay for it. Again, so if someone just kind of has a low need to look stylish, um, they'll just sort of go by what they think is stylish, not by what the price tag uh, says. But if it's very, very high, it's a very, very high, very strong need, they're willing to pay much, much more for it. Wealth, psychological need wealth. So another big uh, thing that clothing has and always been traditionally used to communicate um, is the wealth and status of the wearer. Um, if this is true, of course, the, uh, the wearer will want clothing that can signal their wealth uh, and their status. Um, they will buy clothing that is associated with luxury and wealth and wear things that are conspicuously expensive. Uh, again, the greater the customers need to communicate this, along with their means to, of course, uh, means they will pay more for their clothing. And here we have typical um, signifiers. Um, so a lot of times we will look to very traditional elements like jewelry or watches that use traditionally very expensive materials, diamonds, gold, platinum, uh, other sort of gems uh, and metals that are very expensive, very, very commonly worn to express uh, wealth and means um, along with uh, specific designer logos and things like that. So we have, you know, Louis Vuitton and the Red Bottoms um, that signal uh, uh, very conspicuously, I paid a lot of money for this, these were very expensive, these are designers, but, uh, well with the logos down here. And again, this doesn't mean that everyone that has this need needs to have the money. There are specific ways uh, to try to communicate uh, wealth and status without actually being wealthy. And this also means that not all wealthy people need to wear this clothing. It needs to be a need of them. So um, for instance, in those different examples, if you have someone that might not be particularly wealthy, they still may buy lower price point designer goods. So you can always get a t-shirt with a designer logo on it, right? Um, it's not that expensive. Um, uh, um, you can still save up and afford some of these lower price point items that still are associated uh, with luxury brands and luxury wealth and status um, to uh, at least signal that to, again, your wearers and everything like that. On the other end, you may have someone that's very wealthy that just doesn't really care to communicate it. Um, so they're not going to spend the money to uh, buy, you know, uh, uh, really expensive uh, uh, brands with designer logo logos, really flashy. They're not going to wear flashy watches, flashy jewelry, flashy clothing. 
um, because they just don't need uh, to communicate that they're wealthy. They know they're wealthy, they're fine with it, they're enjoying it, um, but they don't have that need to communicate it, their status and wealth with others. So again, this is not dependent on their income. This is dependent on their psychological needs and their personality, not how much money they actually have. Of course, um, some of these items, um, you will have to have a lot of money to purchase. Um, that's really the best way to signal wealth is just to sort of have an expensive thing. So something like, you know, um, a, a watch like this, which is many thousands of dollars, um, you probably will have to have money and the need to express your status uh, alongside each other. Sexy. So the psychological need to look sexy and attractive will also influence how designers make clothing for their customer. Um, and this can be applied uh, on, on varying scales to different markets. So um, how much does your customer want to look sexy? Um, uh, how much is their desire to look sexy to communicate um, their attractiveness to the outside world? Um, and again, this will influence all different markets um, uh, uh, to varying degrees. Professionalism, even so. Uh, so your workwear market, you may still need that. If it's a great need for your customer, it will even influence their professional work, even though professionalism tends to not be very sexy. Um, uh, sexy tends to give a message of, of uh, actually not professionalism, unprofessionalism. Um, uh, all the way down throughout their, their wardrobe. Um, and of course, we can uh, go to the extreme in, in the sort of high uh, uh, lingerie market. Um, uh, you know, not just your basic clothing, but maybe your more um, high performing lingerie market, let's say. Um, psychologically, not technically, because um, we all know, um, uh, 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 especially us ladies, the technical performance lingerie needs, you know, we need. Um, when we're bouncing downstairs, we want certain things to feel comfortable and stay in place. Um, that's a technical performance of the lingerie market, market but the psychological, uh, of course, goes straight there. It's 100% it's uh, needing to look sexy, needing to communicate attractiveness, so on and so forth. And again, like all of these things, uh, the more a customer has a, this psychological need to portray their sexiness, the more they're willing to pay to achieve it. professionalism and power. The need to communicate one's professionalism is necessary on a job site and is more so for certain jobs. A customer may have a great need to dress professionally in order to be taken seriously at their job. Um, and to take this need a bit further, a customer may have the need to signal their power or prestige. Again, the greater the need, uh, the more a customer will be willing to pay for clothing uh, they will feel will achieve this goal. So this is basically, you know, the category of, of where we see the power suit. We've all heard the phrase power suit. Um, so how did that come about and how does that sort of align with this? Well, if you think about it, the power suit is a signal, a signal I am powerful, I'm professional, um, uh, I can take control of this situation, I'm competent at my job, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a true professional. Um, and again, we use this as a symbol to communicate this goal. And, no, and really, this suit is the epitome of this. So nothing really has been used more so uh, than sort of the men's suit to communicate this, this, this need, uh, to communicate, I'm a professional, I have power, I have prestige, or things like that, or even I'm competent at my job. Um, even so much that um, women have sort of made their own versions of the sort of male suit. And really this originated the, 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 the male suit, uh, business suit that we're so uh, used to seeing. Um, it was traditionally a male's uh, garment, but has nowadays been translated into female versions. But again, we want them to portray the same message. I'm powerful, I'm professional, I'm competent, I'm capable. Um, and again, this is very important message and depending on your job or the certain customers need to portray this, um, uh, they may be willing to pay more. And again, this is 
uh, often why a lot of people will will buy a certain or have a certain or specific quote unquote interview outfit. Uh, they need to communicate very efficiently um, to strangers. You know, um, uh, uh, apparently, if you're going for an interview, that I, you know, again, I'm professional, I'm competent, um, uh, all these different things. Um, and again, some jobs and certain jobs, this is higher. Uh, uh, certain jobs, it's it's not as important. So depending on first your customer, and again the sort of job uh, they're going for or line of work that they have, um, it will be more important for them. Fitness. So this may seem like a repeat of the technical need for performance, but it's a bit different. So when we talk about technical performance of sort of fitness clothes, it's really just its ability to physically perform. Can you move in it? Can it wick your sweat? Do you stay cool in it? Do you stay comfortable in it? Um, but the psychological need, of course, is all about sending a message to someone else. So um, there's, for our sort of fitness and active wear markets, we want to also communicate the fact, hey, I'm athletic, hey, I'm healthy, hey, I'm fit to others. Um, and again, this is a lot of times uh, the really root of a, a sort of trend or emergence of market. So we, uh, over the past few years, have seen a huge emergence and growth in the active wear market. And um, I'll tell you what, a lot of customers are not really buying uh, athletic, uh, so athletic wear, for um, its ability to perform. Uh, they're buying it much more to sort of uh, uh, wear it and sort of communicate the fact, hey, I'm wearing you know, yoga pants, I must work out. <laughs> Guess what, a lot of times they don't. Um, but they're communicating, hey, I'm a healthy fit person and that's a, a sort of positive image that they're portraying to the world. So they're really buying these clothing to portray that image much more than they're buying it for any one of these uh, you know, items to actually physically perform when working out or when jogging or whatever you're doing with them. Um, and that's really sort of spawned uh, the new term. So it used to just be active wear, but now we sort of have a new term called athleisure um, because so many people were sort of buying these clothing because eh, it was comfortable and you can move around in them. I'm not gonna specifically work out in them, but I like the idea that I look like someone that works out in them. I like that I'm portraying that image. It's very similar I, uh, in like uh, when bottled water sort of started become, coming onto the market. I don't know, some of you younger people don't remember the day when we just used to drink water from the sink and bottled water wasn't very big. But when it first started to come out, it was a sort of symbol. If you had a, a bottle of water that you were carrying around with you, you looked healthy because you were drinking water. Um, healthy people drink water, right? So it was almost like an accessory that was very similar to this psychological need. I need people to think that I'm healthy. Um, uh, I'm fit. You know, maybe I'm drinking water because I just worked out. So uh, things like that. So th that fits along very well into this psychological need. There's also a variety of other psychological needs that we dress for, and they're all unique and dependent on the customer. So these are just a various other ones, but there's just a multitude of others, and again, that are gonna be unique to every customer base um, that we sort of have to think about. So as people and cultures and locations are all uh, so very unique, so are the needs people need for their clothing. And you know, all of us wear clothing, so we're all looking to get something out of it, and that will change and, and um, uh, uh, by our own individual personalities, locations, uh, cultures, and things like that. And of course, we may have many psychological needs. It might not just be one. We may have many influences coming together um, because the messages we want to communicate are complex and nuanced, uh, just like we are as people. Um, so we will build and blend psychological needs with one another. So here I just have you know various other um, uh, psychological needs. Again, these are not the only ones, there are many, many ones. We may have a need for spectacle if we are a performer um, uh, on stage, uh, uh, so we need, may need something elaborate and wowish and it will pop. 
Um, we might have a specific subculture we want to identify with. Uh, we might want to indicate uh, something about ourselves, like um, intelligence uh, or something like that, that we may want to do with our dress, um, uh, so on and so forth. So all of these different things will be blended together um, um, in your specific cu cust target customer um, and will influence how you design for them, um, uh, how much you will charge, uh, and what you really want to communicate with your customer. So um, ideally what you want it to communicate with your customer, with your designs is, hey, I get you. If you wear this, you will. I will be satisfying X, Y, and Z needs for you. Okay guys, so that wraps up sort of talking about our customer. Let's talk a little bit about the assignment that will go tandem with this. So um, this is your customer profile assignment. It's gonna be due next week. Um, so the objective is um, obviously that knowing your customer is one of the single best factors uh, in how a designer will plan a collection or biggest factors um, and how a brand will identify itself. Of course, we always want to design and identify uh, with elements and values that our customer will be attracted to. Um, the creation of a target customer profile is an often used method for designers to better get to know their customer. Now the cu target customer profiles, again, we sort of imagine a person, we can base it on someone, of course, in real life. Um, of course, we want to base it in reality. Uh, so if we, our target customer is so unique that they really don't fall into any larger market or demographic, um, it's almost pointless to design for them because you're designing for a singular person. That goes back to why we don't want to design for just ourselves. Um, we need to design for at least a market big enough to sell to that, you know, we'll have enough people buying our clothing so that we're making a profit. Um, so again, even though our cu target customer profile focuses in on one person, they're supposed to be the sort of ideal or archetypal representation of a, um, a demographic or a customer base that you are going to be marketing toward. Um, and better yet, um, they're the sort of customer that your market aspires to be. Um, so your assignment is to create a customer profile by answering the following questions below. Uh, to design one look based on your customer and answer the additional questions describing how this look meets the needs of your customer. So part one, you're going to create a target customer profile and you can include more information than, ju than just this and, uh, and indeed I encourage you guys to include any information that you think would be relevant um, uh, to your customer and would influence your designs. Um, you can use images as well. Um, uh, for different things uh, that would uh, uh, your customer would like, um, would help define their aesthetic and things like that. Um, but uh, minimally, just answer what is the gender of your customer, what is the age of your customer, where does your customer live, uh, what does your customer do for a living, what is their income, what are their music or hobbies, what is your customer value, and what other brands or designers does your customer buy? And this would really uh, indicate who your competition is. Given that information, you're gonna go ahead and design a look for your customer. And of course, this will be a, a look for a specific occasion. So we talked about how um, not only do we need to focus in on a specific customer, but a specific aspect of their life that we're going to design for. So um, in the following questions, the first question um, caters to that. So you must answer, um, and actually it might be helpful for you to sort of look at these questions and understand these questions first and then design your look. So you know that you'll have a good answer for these questions based on your design. Okay, so um, the first question about your look will be what occasion slash occasions will your customer, customer will be wearing this look to? Um, is it a something that they just hang out with their friends? Is it something that they wear to their work? Is it something that they wear to a special occasion like a wedding or something or, or a formal occasion? Um, uh, what is it? Um, how much is your customer willing to pay for this look compared to other clothing? 
So is this a look that they have high um, performance or technical needs attached to, so they're willing to pay more for it? Uh, do they have less technical or performance needs attached to it, so they want to pay less for it? Or is it in the middle? Is it about average? Um, uh, what technical needs does your look satisfy for your customer and how does it do this? What psychological needs does your look let's correct that does your look satisfy for your customer and how does it do this? okay? So we're going to talk about all these different things. Um, so hopefully uh, you will be able to research your customer design the absolute perfect look for them that understands them better than they understand themselves um, and you'll be able to answer exactly uh, what uh, it is doing for your customer. Um, so that will be due again next week and I'll see you then. All right, bye guys.